Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Please get out your King James Bibles. Are you guys ready for another Bible study? Um, I'm really worried because I'm trying so hard not to let this, uh, this channel become a talk show. Okay, a reaction show, a talk show. You see that with a lot of channels online. I've been noticing secular channels. And even with brethren, that they started out being a Bible-believing ministry and they want to preach the Word of God. And now they're putting this down and talking more about the world, reaction to the world, or just, you know, a talk show. My feelings are, my opinions are, and we do that here a little bit. Sit and talks or our walk and talks. And I've got a sit and talk set up to talk about some things about the ministry and the channel. And some things that are on my heart. And there's nothing wrong with that, brothers of Christ. But I really want to push that we need to make sure that we're not steering away from what really matters. This right here. I've said this before in other uh, videos. We need to not forget the mission. We're not supposed to forget who it is we're living for. We're not living for the world. We're not living for ourselves. We're not being respecter of persons and living for the people around us. Right? We're supposed to be living for Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be taking His Word, hiding it in our heart, and living it. So we're going to get into some Bible studies. So I've named, I named this, I, I might, sometimes I'll name a study, and when I go to upload it, I might tweak the title a little bit, but am I a Paulinian? Rightly dividing. I'm going to show you one of many situations where someone grabs from the Old Testament and tries to apply it for doctrine today, and it actually goes against the New Testament. It goes against the Pauline epistles, whether they're grabbing from the Old Testament, like, like the 10% tithe, the Old Testament, and it goes against the New Testament. So that's what we're going to do today. So get your King James Bibles out. Please follow along. And uh, we're going to be going through this. We're going to open up the first two scriptures, because we're going to uh, open to Matthew 18.20. And hold your hand there, and then also turn over to 2 Timothy 4.16 and get both those. 2 Timothy 4.16 and Matthew 18.20. I bookmarked mine. <laughs> so I kind of got ahead a little bit because I bookmarked mine. But we're going to hold these two parts, because why? We're going to read two scriptures that if someone's not following 2 Timothy 2.15... It looks like it's, it, they are contradicting one another, and you can get into a mess. And once again, people are grabbing Matthew 18, 20 and applying that to today. And then when you get to 2 Timothy 4, 16, it says, no, that's not correct. This is what applies to today. And I get called this a lot, Brother Sis Christ. And I'm going off. We'll get into the study. I get called a Paulinian. I don't know if you guys know what that means. So I didn't know what it meant until I got told that you're a Paulinian. I was like, what's that? You only follow the Pauline epistles. And I was like, have you followed this channel? I go throughout the whole Bible. I do Bible studies using the whole Bible for instruction and in righteousness. But when it comes to doctrine, how things are today, for today and only today, and they're not the same as before, the different dispensations. You know, Paul talks about the dispensation of grace that's given me to you, Word. Okay. God dispenses His grace differently in different dispensations. Okay. Doctrine, what I'm learning about doctrine is doctrine is how God sets something up that's just for this time period. Today it's called the time of the Gentiles. So when you say this is for today, when it was for another dispensation, that's when people are crossing dispensational lines. Not to go into it too much, but we're going to use this as an example. Okay. But I get called a Pauline epistle. I say, no, I, I listen to Jesus when he's talking about today. I learned about what Jesus, when he came to, for the kingdom of heaven, and when he came to be the king of the Jewish people, and to bring in the thousand year reign and everything, I, I read those things and I learn from those things. And there's some things in the gospel, and I'm getting ahead of myself, that talk about where Jesus is prophesying today. And I listen to him. I listen to everything Jesus says. I don't ignore what Jesus says. I just know that Jesus, who is God, the Father, manifest in the flesh, set up different dispensations, and a doctrine is a teaching that's just for that dispensation. That's what a doctrine is. That's why it talks about be, don't give in to doctrines of devils. Devils are always trying to bring in doctrines that aren't for today. Either they're not in the Bible at all, or they're trying to grab doctrines from Old Testament, other dispensations, and trying to put it into today. So we're going to use this example real quick. It's what, this verse here, Matthew 18, 20, is a verse that's used 
for trying to justify that you have to go to a, once you get saved, you have to go to a New Testament local church. Talk about a Babel building. You have to do this. If you don't, I don't think you're saved. I'm not sure. I just don't know. I just, I, I'm gonna, I just don't think you're saved. Because someone who's saved, you, yeah. what is Matthew 18, 20? It says here, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, this is Jesus Christ speaking, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Okay. Now I'm getting a little ahead of myself again because what he's talking about there is the Holy Spirit. We're going to get into that a little more. He's talking about how do you get the Holy Spirit when Jesus was there preaching the kingdom of heaven? Where two or more gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Okay. Turn to 2 Timothy 4.16. 2 Timothy 4.16. This is Paul in the New Testament. He says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. He's alone. One man, he's alone. What does he say? I pray to God that, they may lay it, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. Oh, wait, Paul. Only were two or more gathered together in his name, then is he in the midst of them. Paul, if you're alone, Jesus ain't with you. It's where two or more get... Wait a second. Something changed. Paul, I don't, I don't believe in contradictions. I'm a King James Bible believer. This Bible is perfect from cover to cover. Something changed. Now, you don't have to turn here, but Hebrews 9.15. Hebrews 9.15. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is not of no strength at all why the testator liveth. Now, we got Matthew 18, 20 from the four books called the Gospels, and even though they're put in the New Testament, the New Testament doesn't actually start until the death of Jesus Christ. So the first one, Matthew 8, 20, 18, 20, for there, two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That's in the Old Testament. Now, is it the Old Testament prophesying the time of the Gentiles? Because Jesus did. That's how we get the title for this time period. Jesus is prophesying the, the time of the Gentiles. No. It's actually, we're going to find out. We get into it a little bit more. It's just talking about that dispensation, the Old Testament. What's 2 Timothy 4.16? That's in the New Testament. It's after the death of Jesus Christ. Death, burial, and resurrection. But the death of Jesus Christ, that's what brought in the New Testament. Some people say, well, you just got that from Hebrews. Another example of, I don't only follow the Pauline epistles. Instruction and righteousness is there, okay? That's go, that applies to anything. You want a New Testament come in, the death of the testator needs to be there. That's why we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. But the thing is, is Jesus dies within the Gospel, so they put the whole Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the New Testament, because at the end of each of those books, we're in the New Testament. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Okay. But you say, well, Hebrews, Hebrews. Well, why in the book of Hebrews and not in Pauline epistles? You're, you're supposed to be just a Paulinian. I'm not. But I believe when it comes to doctrine, it better be in the Pauline epistles. If it's something that's just for today or just for a specific time period, it better be in the Pauline epistles for today. If you're trying to apply it to today, you have to do this. You need to do this. Chapter and verse, and I mainly say the Pauline epistles. Now, when it comes to instruction and righteousness, when it comes to living right and doing right, we can learn that all through the Bible. Remember, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, the life that you're living for Him. Your day-to-day -day life, your day-to-day -day walk, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That's righteousness. It's mainly you can go all over the Bible for righteousness. I came across somebody once who said that he made out like all four of those have to be in every verse in the Bible. Uh, no, it's just saying when you read something, it's either going to be for, for instruction righteousness, for correction, 
It's going to, it's going to teach you how to correct, properly correct, for, uh, for instruction righteous, for reproof, how to reprove someone who's wrong. You can correct a brother in Christ, but reproof is you're actually rebuking somebody that won't change. Correction is for a brother that you're trying, that, that's the first step. You're trying to correct somebody to get them back on the right path. They refuse to get on the right path, then you rebuke them. Okay? Uh, for doctrine, right? you're going to find one of those four. Sometimes you might find more than just one. You can have doctrine and instruction righteousness. You can have instruction righteousness and correction where it's instructing you the right way to correct somebody, to reprove somebody, you know. You can have more than just one of those things in a verse, but the thing is, is they're trying to say you have to have all four of those? Uh, no. No, no, no. You don't have to have all four. It just says no matter what you read in this book, you're going to find at least one of them. Okay. But why are the Hebrews not in the Pauline epistles? Because the Jewish people are still living under the Old Testament. And you have... Uh, Corinthians, the carnal, the so-called carnal Christians, but you have people that are fakes and frauds mixed in with those that are saved, and they're messing each other up, and they're being very fleshly. Okay? Then you get to Galatians. What's happening in Galatians? You have Jews coming in, trying to bring them back under the Old Testament. Okay, we're well, I'm getting ahead of myself again. Where salvation is of the Jews, but they try to get them back under the Old Testament. So why is it in the book of Hebrews? Because it's trying to warn the Jews that for today, get saved today, and warning the Jews that go into the time of Jacob's trouble, because I believe Hebrews is written to Hebrews, it's trying to warn them, hey, you need to stop trying to be under the Old Testament. You're supposed to be under the New Testament. Okay? They're rejecting the New Testament for the Old Testament, and I believe, some people believe it's Paul that's writing Hebrews, it could be, Pete. some people think it's Peter, Whoever it is that's writing Hebrews, to the Hebrews, he's trying to warn that you guys are still falling for the trap of trying to go back to doing the Old Testament. I was listening to the Bible. I'm going through um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I I'm ending Deuteronomy right now. I'm finally finishing the, the books of Moses, if you want to say, like the Torah and Moses. But I remember in there where they were supposed to go into the Promised Land, and then God said, uh, no, you don't do that. And then they're like... I mean, he told them to go to the promised land, fight these people, take the land that I promised you, and they got more fearful of the world and not trusting God, and they, they did wrong by God, threatened to go back to Egypt and everything, and after God punished them severely and said, okay, now you're going to wander in the wilderness, he made a, a proclamation, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Then they're like, okay, now we'll, we, we, now we'll go take it, and it didn't work out well. Well, they were supposed to be following the Old Testament, and they weren't, the Jews. In Jesus' day, they weren't, okay? Because if they were, they would have accepted him as, as, the, as their Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. They rejected him. They rejected him. And then afterwards, with Galatians, oh yeah, well, now we believe in Jesus Christ, but we still want to go do what we should have been doing before and obeying the Old Testament. But you're not under the Old Testament anymore. You're under the New Testament. But we're going to go do the Old Testament right. We're going to do it right this time. Honest, we're going to do it right this time. It's too late. You crucified your king. You are now under the New Testament. Okay? Paul is preaching the New Testament in his letters. Just, you read his letters and you realize, okay, it's not the same as the Old Testament. We're under the New Testament. Okay? Just because he doesn't say what you hear, what you read in Hebrews, instruction and righteousness, how does the New Testament come in? Paul's preaching the New Testament, but how does it do That's how we know. The death of Jesus Christ. Just wanted to throw that in there to get you know, everything organized. Mm -hmm. Romans 11.25 says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullest of the Gentiles be come in. What's that blindness? They still think they're under the Old Testament. They're still waiting for their Messiah, even though he already came, and they crucified him. But they're still under the, the, the Old Testament. They're blind to Jesus Christ, who is, that his death brought in the New Testament. They're blind to that. It's hard to reach a Jew. Can a Jew get saved today? Absolutely. But it's hard. Primarily, the body of Christ today, primarily, is made up of Gentiles, not Jews. Why is that? Because Jews have a hard time letting go of the Old Testament for the New Testament. 
Now, what we're going to be doing here, those same two verses, if you just read them, because a lot of people do, for the battle buildings, where, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And what do we do? We go to the battle buildings to gather together in his name, and there am I in the midst of them and everything. They try to use that to justify the battle buildings. I call them battle buildings, but these buildings that they build call a church and invite both saved and lost to it, which go against the scripture. Your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. You are the priest. So these buildings also have a priesthood, like a Levitical priesthood. Uh, no, the Bible believer, the person who gets saved and born again, is now part of the priesthood of the believer. Once again, that's told to us in, in Peter, I think. First, second Peter. Hopefully I'm not getting that wrong. But once again, it's being told to the, the, the Jewish people. Why? Because they are still trying to go off the Old Testament where the, you have the Levites and you have a physical priesthood that's only the Levites. You know, you got a Babel, you have a temple built with man's hands, and so on and so forth. And they're having to try to really, Peter and Paul are trying to reach the Jewish people saying, that's the Old Testament. We are now in the New Testament. This is how the New Testament is. Okay? The believer, the person who gets saved and born again, he or she is now a priesthood of the believer. But these Babel buildings, they're still trying to go back to the Old Testament and do things the old way. I always say this and get in a lot of trouble, but it's more like closet Catholics. These Babel buildings seem to line up more with Catholicism than they ever do with the Word of God. And when you call them out for these things, they start attacking you. I've been attacked for saying, hey, those Babel buildings are not good anymore. They might have had good intentions when they were first used to have a just a small building, inexpensive, everyone chips in for the wood and everything. And, you know, before people were hardcore about you have to have land rights, land rights and paying taxes and everything and all that junk. We had little buildings that we built and everyone that was saved would come and meet there and we'd sing hymns and we'd learn, we'd have someone read the Bible because not everybody had a Bible. Not everybody had a Bible. So the main men that had Bibles were preachers and teachers of the Word. Mm -hmm. If you had a Bible, even back like you know, a couple hundred years ago, I'm not talking about like thousands of years. A couple hundred years ago, you still not everybody had a Bible. Today, anybody can have a Bible. Which brings me to the point of, once again, brothers and sisters Christ, or even if you're lost and you've come across this video and you've <laughs> bared with me for this long, you desperately want a, a King James Bible, contact this ministry, the, the about page of this ministry, the description of this ministry. There's an email, okay? There's a P.O. box and there's an email, and we'll get you a King James Bible. If you're truly saved and born again and you have a cheap Bible that's falling apart and you want a really nice Bible, King James Bible, contact the ministry. We got, I don't want to get ahead of myself because that's going to be part of our sit and talk later about the 10 Bibles that going over to Belgium, okay, getting prayer requests for them. But that's part of this ministry to get Bibles to people. But not everybody had a Bible. So building these buildings, it was a little innocent, see? And at first you think, well, there's nothing wrong with it. But when you see what these buildings have become today, because those buildings that were built, this ain't a church. This is just, you know, a building that we meet together and the whole town comes together to sing hymns and worship God and to hear the Bible being read and spoken about, you know, good preaching. And now you look at what it's become today. It's far from where the Bible believers were using it. Now, Catholicism was using it way before the Bible believers were. We're building buildings, calling them temples. You have to come here to worship. You have to come here to hear the Word of God. And only that priest up there can understand the Word of God. And you've got to come to him. That's Catholicism. But you start getting that, that atmosphere in all of these buildings, whether they're Baptist buildings, uh, Protestant buildings, uh, Methodists, all these things. I call a lot of them just daughter, uh, Daughters of the Whore of Babylon, uh, closet Catholics, what they, 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 like I said, they line up more with Catholicism. I'm not saying everybody that goes there is Catholic. If you go to a battle building, Brother and Sister Christ, I'm not saying you're guaranteed Catholic. I'm just saying they line up more with Catholicism and they do more harm today than when they started. So they'll grab that verse to, and to justify the battle building system and to justify a lot of the practices that go on in the battle building, they will grab from the Old Testament. And remember, this study we're putting together it's going to be a little bit of a long one, so please bear with me. And you can break it up in multiple parts if you want to and watch it in multiple parts. But the whole point is this rightly dividing. I've been called a Paulinian. You're just a Paulinian. You're just a Paulinian. Where in the Pauline epistles does it say where two or three are gathered together in my name? There 
am I in the midst of them? If you want me with you, Jesus said, if you want me with you, you need to come together two or more. Where is Paul saying that? He talks about fellowship. He does. He talks about coming together and being there for one another. But where is he saying you have to come together two or more and then Jesus is with you? We already read in 2 Timothy 4.16, he's alone, but he's not alone. Jesus is with me. That contradicts them trying to grab Matthew 8.20 and try to apply it today, saying it's for today. You know what the instruction, I'm going to get ahead of myself. You know what the instruction righteous, because we're going to go through this, the Matthew 18.20 for instruction righteousness, where 2 Timothy 4.16 is actually doctrine for today. Okay? The instruction righteous, if you want Jesus, if you want God with you, then you need to do it God's way. And there was different dispensations where if you want God with you, you had to do it this way. If you don't do it this way, in that dispensation, God will not be with you. Okay? Different dispensations. For the kingdom of heaven, that's what you had to do for God to be with you. For the time of the Gentiles, the kingdom of God, that spiritual kingdom, the time of the Gentiles, if you want Jesus with you, God with you, you have to do it this way. Okay? The instruction righteousness that we're going to be teaching is that you've got to obey God and do things God's way for the time period that He declares. It's that simple. Okay? We're going to go through the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Because I believe that Matthew 18.20 is talking about the kingdom of heaven, and I can prove it. We can prove it in two seconds. But we're still going to go way into it. We're going to get into it. We're going to do a good Bible study with your permission, brothers and Christ. With God's permission, but for your, if you bear with me, be patient. We're going to go, because I know some people are probably turning the video off right now, going, oh, he's attacking the battle buildings. Oh, he's just going to do... I've been told that, that people just don't want to follow Matthew 18, 20, and they're the ones taking out a con... And they just close their ears off, and they don't want to listen anymore. If you bear with me, if you have a love of the truth, and you're willing to listen, okay, we're going to go through the kingdom of heaven, and we're going to go through the gospel for today, the, the time of the Gentiles. Okay? And we're going to follow 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We start learning about rightly dividing in the time of the Gentiles. Why is that? Because the time of the Gentiles is the New Testament, and we're not under the Old Testament, and we have to do some serious rightly dividing. Whereas in the Old Testament, you're under the Old Testament. There was still a little bit of rightly dividing that was going on, but at the time, we really the pressure really got put on to rightly divide today in the time of the Gentiles. Why? Because it's so easy to get messed up going back to the Old Testament. And that's what people are doing. They're trying to get you back under the Old Testament. Matthew 18.20 is under the Old Testament, whereas 2 Timothy 4.16 is New Testament. Okay. So Matthew 18, 20, we're going to read it again. For if two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, since we're still in 18, hopefully you still have the Bible open. To, i got to go back. I was in 2 Timothy. We will go back to 2 Timothy. So Matthew, this is where I'm at in Matthew 25 in the New Testament. I'm in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. I'm in Matthew in the New Testament. I go through the whole Bible. I'm not a Pauline pit. Paulinian, where I, I guess they try to label you Paulinian because you only read the Pauline epistles. Believe it or not, when Paul first wrote his letters, I believe that the church, the body of Christ, they only had the Pauline epistles. They didn't have the Old Testament. Oftentimes they probably didn't even have all the Gospels yet because all the Gospels, who knows what was written first, all the Pauline epistle letters or the Gospels. Okay. But they definitely had the Pauline epistles. Can you get saved today, know what Jesus Christ did for you, and live a life of Christ and be a living witness and looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living all through the Pauline epistles? Absolutely. Absolutely. Am I so grateful we have the whole Bible today? I'm so blessed because not everyone had it. We talked about this. Not everyone had a Bible. And not everyone had the whole Word of God in one book, one volume. We are so blessed today. Get back to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Now, remember, they like to grab that verse, Matthew 18, 20. For there are two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. See, that tells us that these Babel buildings, you need to be going to these Babel... But wait a second, did you stop and ask them, what does Matthew 18, 1 say? At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, 
who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is mentioned again in verse 3. The kingdom of heaven is mentioned again in verse 4. Now you say, well, 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 that was the first four verses, and by the time you get to uh, Matthew 18, 20, now he's talking about today, right? What does Matthew 18, 23 say? Verse 23. And verse 18, verse 23. Therefore, this is after 24, two or three or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. 23, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king. They're talking about the kingdom of heaven in this whole verse. Are we under the kingdom of heaven today? Absolutely not. And we're going to talk about what the kingdom of heaven is. Okay? Chapter starts with the kingdom of heaven, and it's still talking about the kingdom of heaven after verse 20. It's all for the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus was physically present, preaching the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, when he comes in and reigns, he was there as their king. It got put off in the time of Jacob's trouble. You're going to go back to the kingdom of heaven gospel, I believe, in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's going to be the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom. It's going to be both gospels melded together. There's going to be faith and works. But it's the time of Jacob's trouble, time of Jacob's trouble, is to prepare the people, the Jewish people, for the rule of their king, Jesus Christ coming back and ruling for a thousand years. Just like when Jesus came, John the Baptist, we're going to get into him, was preparing the way for their king. So it was John the Baptist doing it. Okay. It's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Now, verse 11, 12, what is the kingdom of heaven? It's the physical kingdom. Well, how do you get that? Matthew eleven twelve. 12. Let's go back to Matthew 11, verse 12. And from the day of, the, of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. So the kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom that can be taken by violence and with force, and that people would be fighting over it till this very day. Where is that? That's Jerusalem. That's over in Israel. Okay. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom. Now, let's get back to Matthew 20. Or 18, verse 20. I'm going to leave this open there. 18, verse 20. For where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Something I wanted to point out. Now, what does it mean, two or more are gathered? There, and how is it, how is it, where's the evidence that he's in the midst of them? You know, remember, the Jews require a sign. The kingdom of heaven is just for the Jews. We're going to get to that. It's for the, for the Jewish people and for their king, for Jesus to come in to rule and reign as their king. But they require a sign. So what's the sign that two or more are gathered together and that Jesus is in the midst of them? Turn to Mark 6, 7. Mark 6, 7. And he called unto him twelve and began to send them forth, what? Two by two? Where two more or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them? I believe it's the Holy Spirit. And the Old Testament, when Jesus was physically present, remember the, the Gospels, Old Testament, until Jesus dies, the Holy Spirit would come and go. They couldn't come down and stay until Jesus left. He was ascended up, remember, because we're going to get into those verses. But they could get the Holy Spirit temporarily. Okay? He began to send them forth two by two. Because what does it say here? It says, And gave them power over unclean spirits. They were also healing people. They are casting out demons, and they were healing people. Those are uh, mar marks of the Holy Spirit, fruits of the Holy Spirit, okay? power of the Holy Spirit, if you want to say. So how they get it? They went two by two, and they went in his name. They were not preaching his death, burial, and resurrection. They were preaching the kingdom of heaven. Repent, be water baptized, cleanse yourself, get clean, get ready, because your king's coming in. Okay? Verse 8, and commanded them that they should not... Take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals and put on two coats, and not put on two coats. Okay. Two by two, were two or more gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And then gave them, when they came together in his name, I believe the Holy Spirit came down, and they were able to cast out demons, 
power over unclean spirits. Okay. Matthew 10, 5, 10, 5 says, The twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any city the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I can't remember if I'm using that verse because I get, get ahead of myself sometimes, but Jesus was talking to somebody. He said, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. When Jesus is preaching the kingdom of heaven, salvation is of the Jews. In the time of the Gentiles, salvation goes out to the world, Jew or Gentile. All right. And I'm going to be able to prove that a little bit later. Here it is, uh, John 4.22. Ye worship, ye know not what. That's John 4.22. For we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So he's sending him out two by two, telling him only go in the way of the, Gent uh, the Jews, stay away from the Gentiles, only preach to the Jews. They're healing and casting out devils by the whole. I mean, by the Holy Spirit. People keep saying, you keep saying, well, you keep saying the Holy Spirit, but this whole thing is about how to have Jesus with you. We'll get to that. When Jesus, because the Bible teaches us that if you have the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus. Remember where it talks about the, the sister in Christ having the hidden man of the heart? It's not talking about Jesus physically dwelling within her. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. Okay. But here you see that it's only the Jews. But there's two people going out. And the evidence, Jews require a sign that they are going in the name of Jesus Christ is they're performing miracles. They're casting out demons. They're healing people. Luke chapter 10 verse 1. After these things the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whether he himself would go. Now stop right there. I've used these verses, because I don't ignore them, I've used these verses for instruction righteousness. When you're going out to do the work of the Lord, it's best to go two by two. He's shown us when he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, he's sending them out two by two. How, why would that be kind of different today when it comes to trying to preach the gospel? If you follow Paul around, he's always saying, I want you with me, I want you with me, I need you for the ministry. Why? Because we're supposed to be out there two or more. But there is a difference. If you're by yourself, because Paul, people will point that out. Well, Paul, remember when Paul was preaching to Athens? I think it was Athens, where he found that monument or statue that says to the unknown God. And some, the Holy Spirit just dwelled up in him because you can have the Holy Spirit with only one person. And he was, it said before he did anything, he was waiting. What is he waiting for? He's waiting for brethren to show up so they can start preaching the gospel. Two or more to start preaching the gospel. But the Holy Spirit, and they've given himself, the whole people in this whole town has given himself up to total idolatry. It just burned with them, and he started preaching the gospel early. Can you do that today? Absolutely. Why? Because you can have the Holy Spirit with just one. You don't need two or more gathered together to have the Holy Spirit. Just one. Now, instruction righteous, like I said, the, 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 it's the... It's the, it's the general rule when you go out to be, evan be an evangelist and evangelize, you need to have two or more. That's the general rule. But there's times where that can't happen and God will still open doors for the individual to witness and testify. We're all supposed to be in the ministry of reconciliation. One, on, one person can witness to somebody else. One on one or one can witness to a few people. You can still do that today. Okay. But I just want to bring that up because I have used these verses for instruction righteousness saying, hey, when you go out to, if you want to be an evangelist and you want to actually go out and street witness, you need to go out two by two. You need to be out there with two or more. A, because the Bible says we're, the, we're, we're two or more. Uh, we just read that, to gather together in my name. Uh, that's not the one I'm thinking of. The one I'm thinking of is um, before the witness of one, I, I'm butchering this, please forgive me, brothers of Christ. Where the witness of one or two in other words, it's talking about you have to have two or more, where two or three witnesses are, let every word be established. Where two or three witnesses are, let every word be established. There's supposed to be two of you as a witness for Jesus Christ, going out and preaching the gospel and everything. Also, in these last days, you kind of need a second witness to say, hey, they're saying I said this, I didn't. They're saying I did this, I didn't do that. A lot of times people take cameras today. Uh, I don't blame them. Okay, for safety and security. But 
He sent them out two by two for the kingdom of heaven. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Not today. Go, you, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Okay. In Mark 9.38 we read, And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followed us not. And we forbade him, because he followed us not. Remember he says, in thy name. Now people will grab this and go, See, see, there's just one. Let, let's, let's actually break this down. He said, in thy name. Now what did Jesus say? When two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. For these people, for this person to be uh, call, casting out devil, there had to be somebody else with them that was also there in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe this book doesn't contradict. Let's keep reading, verse 39. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. Now once again, I believe there were others with this one man because the Bible does not contradict itself. I believe there were more than one person there, but the one actually casting out the devil is the one being confronted. That's what I believe. They're, they're seeing the one. There could have been like three or four men walking together and the one sees someone in Jesus' name and one sees someone afflicted by a devil, and he walks over and casts out the devil in Jesus' name, but there's still more than just one person, but he's the one that's doing the actual act of casting someone out. And that's who, who his disciples are confronting. And Jesus says, don't do it. They're casting out the devil in my name. Remember, where two or more are gathered together, and my name, there am I in the midst of them. And what's the... What's the sign for the Jewish people that Jesus is in the midst of them? Talking about the Holy Spirit. We're going to get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. But I want to really break it down all these times, okay? Uh, Matthew 14. People will say, well, what about this one? What about this one? Matthew 14. And when they were come to the multitude... I think it's Matthew 14. Okay. That just says Matthew 14. <laughs> I left out the uh, chapter. Okay. Please forgive me, brothers and Christ. I left out the chapter. But basically what we're going to be talking about, and someone can put it in the comment section or I might be able to correct it. Um, but uh, what we're going to be talking about is the devil that couldn't, uh, the demon that couldn't be cast out by the apostles. Okay? So, it's verse 14, but I forgot to put the chapter down. Forgive me. And when they were come to the multitude... That still bothers me. That I made that mistake. And when they were come... But you got to spell words right. Okay. There it is. It's Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Please forgive me for this is Christ. 17. Let's get 17 in here. Matthew 17. Forgive me for this is Christ. Thank God for sword searchers. <laughs> But Matthew 17, 14, and when there came to the multitude, there came, a, him, came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, and for oftentimes he falleth into the fire and often to the water. And I brought him to, to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Well, well two or more gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. And the sign of that was they were casting out devils, and healing people. Hmm. But they couldn't cast out this demon, but they came together as name. What's different with this situation? Let's keep reading. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. 
And Jesus rebuking the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that hour. Right? Pardon me. So they're like, why couldn't we do it? The apostles were like, why can't we do it? It's verse 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Verse 21. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Bible perversions like to take out the word fasting, because they don't want you casting out certain demons. What we're learning here is as you say there were times when they could not heal or cast out when two or more gathered together. Yes, but they lacked faith. And or there was prayer and fasting with the two or more, where there's two or more gathered together in his name. Prayer and fasting, they, maybe they didn't pray and fast. They were praying a little bit, but they're not fasting with the prayer. It's prayer and fasting, or it's just prayer. If it's just prayer, it won't work. It's prayer and fasting, and you have to have faith. Don't let your faith waver. They're, when they first attempted, they probably came through gung-ho, I got all this faith. But when it didn't happen because they didn't pray and fast, there was something missing. Instead of saying, God, what are we missing through Jesus Christ, who is God? Jesus, what am I missing? What are we doing wrong here? Like they did, they did finally go to him after the fact. But they could have gone to him before the fact and said, hey, we need help, Jesus. I don't know what we're doing wrong. We believe and we have faith and, and everything. And he could have told them, well, you need to pray. Some demons can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. But they were probably gung-ho the first attempt, but then when it didn't work, then the second and third, and it's like, well, maybe this doesn't work right. Or maybe when two or more gather together in his name, maybe that's not. They start losing faith. And do you see that happening today in structure and righteousness? When things don't go exactly the way you want them to go? You know, according to plan, as they say? When things don't go exactly according to plan, you start to lose faith. Your faith starts waning. It starts weakening. When you see how bad the world's getting, because you get distracted by the world, instead of keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. So we see that, okay? but let's get into that. I believe when it's talked about two or more gathered together, what's the sign of that? Where's the evidence that Jesus is with them? The Holy Spirit comes in so they can perform those miracles, and then the Holy Spirit would leave. Where two or more were gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of him. Okay? Uh, we're going to get to that verse when we get to the New Testament. We talk about the New Testament. But we're going to get to the verse about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. When Jesus says he's going to send the Comforter, he's saying, I will be with you. How do you have Jesus in the midst of you? You get saved today, the, the correct way for today. How did you get Jesus in the midst of you back then? Where two or more gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Salvation, we're going to talk about the kingdom of heaven, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Why am I Matthew a lot over the others? Because people get confused when you get to Mark and Luke. And you, I still quote from Mark and Luke. I don't avoid it. But you get to Mark and Luke, it doesn't say kingdom of heaven. It'll say kingdom of God. Kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are the same thing. The kingdom of God can mean the physical kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, or it can mean the spiritual kingdom, which today is the time of the Gentiles, but the spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of God is two parts, physical, spiritual. Okay. Temporal, eternal. <laughs> spiritual is eternal. Physical, temporal. Okay. But someday his kingdom, that thousand year reign, God's, at the end of the thousand year reign, God's going to judge the earth again, destroy the earth, and rebuild his kingdom where it is eternal. Both the physical and spiritual are both are going to be eternal from that point on. But right now, in the Old Testament to now, the physical kingdom has always been tempor temporal, temporary. And you can see the rise and fall. Mm -hmm. But the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 3, 1. And those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven? Yes. He was preaching Jesus, that God was going to send the Messiah, that Jesus was going to come, and he's going to rule and reign. But you guys got to get ready for him. You need to repent and be water baptized. That's what the baptism is. 
For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. They are repenting, having sorrow in their heart, and they're confessing their sins. They're being water baptized to clean themselves, works, and getting ready for their king to come in. Turning back to God, doing things God's way, the Old Testament way. Right. Matthew 4, 17, it says, From this time Jesus began to preach. What time? When John the Baptist got put in prison. From this time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He continued that same gospel of the kingdom of heaven. In Mark 1.14 we read, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now this is in Mark. But what's it talking about? We just read in Matthew 4.17 the same situation. From that time Jesus began to preach. What time? When John was put in prison. Then you read Mark, the same time period, and it says the kingdom of God. This is another good example of rightly dividing the word of truth. Kingdom of God here is a reference to the physical kingdom. I know some preachers get out there and get so full of themselves, and they think the kingdom of God is always a reference to the spiritual, because it says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's, it's uh, the joy, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. I hope I'm not butchering it too much, but not in my notes. But um, they, they read that passage because the kingdom of God can be a reference to the, to the spiritual kingdom as well. And when he says the kingdom of God, he's not talking about the physical, he's talking about the spiritual. And when you're talking about the spiritual, it's not meat and drink. It's spiritual. But the kingdom of God can be a reference to the physical kingdom. We see it right here. Verse 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. What gospel? The kingdom of heaven. The physical kingdom's coming. Your king coming to reign. Your Messiah. The Christ. You better get ready. You better get ready. Is that, and that's what's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. That seven year time period after we go home, get called up. Right? The time of the Gentiles is done. There's going to be a seven year time period where God's going back to preparing the Jewish people for the kingdom of heaven. The thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Uh, John 4 1. In John 4 1, we read, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. What's he doing? He's preaching. Remember, we just read there, he's going out, he took over for John, he's starting to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's also baptizing with water. Not the Holy Ghost, with water. How do we know this? Baptize more disciples than John. Verse 2. Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. Jesus did not baptize anybody with water. Why? Because you... I'm getting ahead of myself, but we'll, we'll get into that. Paul, our, our John will say, we're going to reread it properly, but... He talks about that I baptize with water, but he that cometh after me, it's him that's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's why Jesus didn't baptize anybody with water, because he's not to baptize with water. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. So you see that he took over for John and started preaching the kingdom of heaven, where it's repent, be water baptized, and believe the gospel. What was the gospel? That he's their king. He's coming in to rule and reign. But you've got to get ready. You say, why didn't he just jump up and throw on a crown and start ruling? Because the people had to be ready and cleansed. They had to repent. They had to be water baptized. And they had to turn back to God with the life they're living. The Old Testament life of living for God. So he could come in and be their king. But they wouldn't do that. They loved the water baptism. They, they confessed their sins. But they had the hardest time turning back to God, obeying the Old Testament, and being ready for their king to come in and rule and reign. 
A lot of them mainly just came down to faith where they didn't believe that Jesus was actually their king. How do we know this? Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, 3. Okay, they didn't have faith. They didn't believe Jesus was who he said he was. He's, he's the Son of God, the only begotten Son. He's God the Father manifest in the flesh. Before Abraham was, I am. I and my Father are one. Philip says, show us the Father, and it suffices us, Jesus. Jesus says, Philip, have that no long, have, have been so long with me, and has that not known me, Philip? Philip said, no, no, show us the Father. You've been with me, and you don't know who the Father is? Believe not that I'm in the Father, and the Father in me? They had to believe that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, the Christ, the Messiah. Matthew 16, 13, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, capital S, Son of Man, remember it doesn't say Son of God, Son of Man. Now real quick, just a real side note, when you see capital S, Son of Man, it's talking about the Kingdom of Heaven, where Jesus is supposed to be physically ruling and reigning from the line of King David. His bloodline is supposed to go back to King David. Rightful heir, rightful king. That's what Son of Man, when it calls Jesus the Son of God, it's talking about the spiritual side where it's God manifest in the flesh. Okay, the Son of Man am. Okay, going back to King David. His bloodline going back to King David through Mary. Verse 14, And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Remember, he took over for John the Baptist. He was like, you know, just John the Baptist reborn or something. Some Elias. Remember the prophecy that Elias would come and prepare the way. John was a type of Elias. He was a prophet for the Lord. Okay. And others, Jeremiah, he was also a prophet. So basically they're just saying that you're just a prophet. Okay. That's what they're saying. We're here. Or one of the prophets. They're just saying he's a prophet. They, that's most of the people back then. They did not believe that he was capital S, Son of Man, capital S, Son of God. These God manifest in the flesh that he was the, their king. He was the Messiah, the Christ. Verse 15, he says, And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The capital S, Son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Okay. And we talk about how the Holy Spirit comes in and, and leads you into all truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. When he's speaking, he's speaking truth. Or you can get truth from the Holy Spirit through, his, through God's Word. But it's always based on God's Word. Okay. Remember, he sent them out two by two. Where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. They had the Holy Spirit to cast out. And it says here, you didn't learn this of your own self, so Simon Bar-Jonah. Uh, Bar but revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. There's a connection between God the Father, which is the soul, and the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, and the soul, and Jesus Christ, the body, and Jesus Christ, the body, and the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God, the Son of God, and God. There's connection. Right now, God the Father can show me things in this book, but He does it through the Holy Spirit. If I have the Holy Spirit in me, I have Jesus in me. They're connected. They're all one. But I'm not going to get into the Godhead okay, too much right now. But brothers, this is Christ. Flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Repent, be baptized with water, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. The, you have to believe that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that Jesus... The Christ, the Son of the Living God, the Christ, the Son of the Living God, is coming back to rule and reign, and you had to believe that Jesus was it. He's the one. Okay. The King of the Jews to bring in the Kingdom of Heaven, their Messiah. And once again, the Kingdom of Heaven was only for the Jews. I really wanted to go through that to explain the Kingdom of Heaven. I know we could go in a lot more deeper, but just the basics. You had to repent, you had to be baptized with water, Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And those that did that, 
When two or more were gathered together in his name, there was he in the midst of them. And there was evidence that the Holy Spirit would come down and be in the midst of them because if Jesus wasn't there physically, how is he there spiritually, the Holy Spirit? So when the Holy Spirit would come down, the evidence of that is they were casting out devils and healing people when he sent them out two by two. Okay. That's the whole point of where two or more gathered together in my name. That, I believe, is how they got the Holy Spirit temporarily. It wasn't permanent. Okay. They say, well, what about the verse saying the Holy Spirit can't come unless he... He's talking about permanently. Today we're sealed until the day of redemption. We're sealed. Okay. Matthew 3.11. Turn to Matthew 3.11. Here we're going to get into that. Matthew 3.11. Back then, they were only baptized with water. People get on to me because I say that water baptism is not for today whatsoever. And I have to make an apology. Because I used to say that the, the getting water baptized, it's after salvation and it's just an outward showing. I was 100% wrong. I was parroting what other people said. No great men of God have said. But the more I study it, the more I realize there is no water baptism for today whatsoever. It's only for the kingdom of heaven. And the book of Acts, once again, I keep getting ahead of myself. We're going to talk a little bit about the book of Acts where it's a transition book. Both the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is being preached. The physical and the spiritual are both being preached. They're still trying to give the Jews another chance okay, for Jesus to come back and rule and reign. We're going to get into that a little bit. Okay? But water baptism is not for the outward showing. Oh, it's an outward showing. I used to say that. And I'm mocking myself. An outward showing. I'm trying not to mock. But people say it's an outward showing. No, the outward showing is the changed life. Living the life of Christ. Made unto us wisdom. Sanctification. I think it's wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Those four things have to be present in someone's life as evidence of salvation. Wisdom. Is God's word on your heart? Did you get saved God's way? Wisdom. Righteousness. God's righteousness is imputed to you. You belong to God and you start doing things God's way. You have that attitude. Not the doing part, but you have that heartfelt attitude. I'm going to do what pleases God because I belong to Him. His righteousness was imputed to me. Jesus died for my sins. I belong to Him now. I was bought with a price. I'm not my own. And it's that heartfelt attitude and, and that I belong to Him. Lord, you command, I obey. And what does that lead to? Sanctification. The changed life. Redemption. That life that you live now, you're always living for that blessed hope. You're looking for that blessed hope. Those four things. Okay. The outward showing is the changed life. The new creature in Christ Jesus. Not water baptism. I've been wrong about that. We're going to talk about it a little bit. I'm going to go off a little bit on baptism, water baptism. Just a little bit. So bear with me. Matthew 3.11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is John the Baptist. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Remember we just read, Jesus didn't baptize anybody with water. Why? Because water baptism was for the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus was preparing for the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom. He knew that he was going to have to die and be buried and rise again the third day. He was getting ready because in the end, those who get to go to heaven, especially the ones that, in the Old Testament, the water baptism, they still, if anybody got water, let's say it this way, if anybody got water baptized, follow the, you know, John the Baptist, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, that's what we see in the book of Acts, and, you know, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. What happened to somebody who died before Jesus died? They went to Abraham's bosom. Why? Because they weren't baptized with the Holy Spirit. They were only baptized with water. They, didn't, they went to hell, but they went to Abraham's bosom. I don't know if you remember that study we did about hell. You go you look at hell, there's two parts to hell. The burning side of hell, and you have Abraham's bosom. But both are in hell, because King David says, Thou will not leave my soul in hell. In other words, he's not going to remain in Abraham's bosom. King David didn't go to the fire, burning sides of hell. He went to Abraham's bosom. But God's not going to leave him there. Jesus, after his death, went down to Abraham's bosom. He's like, okay, I'm baptizing all you guys in the Holy Spirit. And now you guys get to go to heaven. But it's Jesus who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. 
And if you actually go to the burning sides of hell, you're being baptized with fire. How do we know this? Keep reading. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquestionable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized of him. The water baptism. Jesus gets water baptized. But John's saying, this water baptism, it's not permanent. This isn't the way to get into heaven fully and completely. We, we still need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. We need that man. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Are we to be baptized with water today? No, but by Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 1.12. 1 Corinthians 1.12. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Remember, John was baptizing. When John was baptizing, he wasn't baptizing in the name of Jesus. Paul was, they always say it was the Baptist, I mean John the Baptist, I'm sorry, John the Baptist, when he was uh, baptizing, he wasn't baptizing in the name of Jesus. They always called the bat. It was the baptism of John. If you remember, where Jesus, we, what Paul had to deal with pe some people that he asked him, it says, "We only know the baptism of John. We don't know about Jesus. We don't know about his death, burial, and resurrection. We only heard of the baptism of John. It was John's baptism." Now, what Paul's saying here is, you got people starting to be respecter of persons and saying. When someone baptizes you, you tend to look at that person as doing the baptizing, because he is. If it's water baptism, if I, I got water baptized as a lost person, a false convert, and whoever it was that was doing the baptizing, he was the one that baptized me. I wasn't baptized by Jesus Christ. And that's truth. Anytime, even if you're saved and born again, if someone baptized you under water, they're the ones doing the baptism. It's the baptism of that person. Paul's saying, sometimes some of you guys are getting caught up in the water baptism. But that's not for today. Right? You're getting, becoming a respecter of persons, getting caught up, and that person doing the work. What happened to Jesus Christ? Paul was crucified. Okay. I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized baptize none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. Now he says, I baptized. John the Baptist baptized. Okay, you have Apollos here, whether Apollos baptized, Peter baptized, John baptized, it's their baptism of this water. It's not God's, it's theirs. Verse 16, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Because remember in the book of Acts, it was a transition book. They were preaching the kingdom of heaven along with the kingdom of God. The spiritual kingdom. Verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Oh, come on, Paul. Water baptism? It's, you have some people out there who believe it's part of salvation. Oh, no, you got to get water baptized to get saved. No, you don't. Then you have those like the Baptists. Well, it's, it's not really for salvation, but... You should do it after you get saved. No. There's no, you should do it after you get saved, chapter and verse on that. It's not there. It's not there. When Paul talks about the man being dead and buried with Christ, and the new man is raised from Christ, he's talking about raised from the dead. But a lot of times, for instruction righteousness, the water, going under the water and coming out, your whole body is clean. That's what it was about water baptism. You go under and you come out, now you're clean. You go down dirty and you come up clean. For instruction righteousness, when we get saved, we liken that. But what, what, for today, Paul takes it a step further and he talks about death. Not water baptism, he talks about death. The old man is dead and buried. He's gone. God has given you a new life now. And that life is in his son. God has given you a new life and that life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Eternal life, sealed into the day of redemption. 
The Holy Spirit comes in and stays. It's permanent. When someone gets saved. It wasn't like that in the Old Testament. When they were water baptizing, it wasn't like that. They weren't getting the Holy Spirit. And those that did, because we talked about the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, it was temporary. It would come and go, I believe. Today it's permanent. That's why Paul likens it to someone getting buried in the grave and raising. He doesn't liken it to water baptism. And here he says, for, I baptize, verse 16, And I baptize also the household of Stephen, besides I know not whether I baptize any other. Verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize. Remember the gospel this that was given to me to you word Paul talks about? It's revealed to Paul, the gospel for today. The gospel for today has no water baptism in it whatsoever. Before salvation, after salvation. But to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. How does the cross of Christ become made of none effect? It's no longer what Jesus did for you. It's about what you're doing, or what Paul did for you, or what Apollos did for you. Or what John the Baptist did for you. Or what so-and-so did for you. The Babel building system. You know, Salvation is about what Jesus Christ did for us. At the cross. You want to get saved? You need to go to the cross and get baptized by Jesus Christ. Holy Ghost baptized. Water will do nothing before or after salvation. Now, before you get all upset with me, I, I, I keep talking about maybe doing an even more in-depth study on this, but water baptism is not for today at all. Before or after salvation. Okay? It's an outward showing. The outward showing is you profess Jesus Christ, not just in words, but the life that you live. That's the outward showing. Rem remember, John said, I baptize you. Paul said that he did baptize at very few, but it, is a, but it is the baptism of Jesus Christ you want. It's what he's probably he's trying to say when you reach through this. you got some people in here that think that, well, because I did a little, performed a little ceremony, I did something small. Remember, this is in Corinthians, where they were still given into sin and wickedness. There was no wisdom, uh, righteousness, sanctification, rede uh, redemption. Those four key things were not being shown in most of these people. They were still looking like the world, acting like the world, doing very sinful, wicked things. And they're thinking, hey, you know, hey, I got baptized. Here it is. We're reading. I got baptized. 1 Corinthians 4.12. I got baptized. What are you talking about? I got water baptized. That's my outward showing. No. You made the cross of Christ of none effect by the water baptism. You need to get baptized by the Holy Ghost. You need to come to Him broken and truly get saved and born again where your heart is now he's the master he's the king he's the lord he commands i obey there's sanctification there's change the changed life that's what matters true salvation through jesus christ not through water baptism not through anything that you're doing but what he did for us at the cross now not the baptism of paul or apollos or john the baptist Water baptism today has, is how the cross of Christ is having none effect. Now, I understand not everyone preaches that water baptism is for salvation, but you've got some people who say you have to be water baptized to be fully and completely saved. What does that do? That makes the cross of Christ of none effect. Why? Because that was for the kingdom of, of, of heaven, gospel. That's not for today. Going back to the main verses we're talking about, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of you. It's the kingdom of, of, of uh, heaven gospel. What's going on today? They're trying to grab you and bring you back under the Old Testament. They're trying to bring you back under the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. We're not under that gospel. Once again, getting baptized by water does nothing for you. In any way, shape, or form, what's an outward showing? The better outward showing is that you have a changed life. The new creature in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that if you were water baptized, you're lost. I'm not saying if you didn't get water baptized, you're not saved like some people. Right? I'm saying it's pointless. There's no real point in it. Other than to drag you back under the Old Testament, getting you deceived by works. Thinking that, oh, that's what saved you. Because in the Old Testament, water for the kingdom of heaven, it was part of salvation. 
But today it's not part of salvation. Paul's like, I didn't get called to, 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 to baptize. Why? Because I'm called to preach the gospel that's for today, the time of the Gentiles. And the gospel of today, Jesus does the baptizing through the Holy Ghost. He does the baptizing, not me. I can't save you. Were you crucified for me? I can't save you. You want to get saved? Jesus is the only way. P.S. Remember that Acts is a transition book. Remember Stephen seeing Jesus standing at the right hand of God, not seated. They were preaching Jesus' return to rule and reign for a thousand years. That's why you had water baptism at the beginning of the book of Acts and partly through the Acts. The water baptism was there. They say, what about the water baptism in Acts? Well, you read about Stephen where he's trying to preach to them that Jesus is their king and that he can come back and rule and reign. And the next thing you know, he looks up because they're getting ready to stone him to death and reject Jesus Christ the second time. He looks up and everything teaches that Jesus is seated at, seated at the right hand of God. Yet Stephen looks up and he sees Jesus standing. He's ready to come back if the people would follow the kingdom of heaven gospel. But they didn't. The gospel of the kingdom of heaven was still being preached at the same time the kingdom of God is. You got the spirit, the time about the spiritual side. Okay? That Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day, proving that he is God, proving he was the Christ, he was the Messiah, but he's God manifest in the flesh. They would preach that, but they'd also preach uh, how he died for the, sin, the sins of the world, because of the sins of the world. But you get to a point where the water baptism is gone, and now you need to be baptized by Jesus with the Holy Ghost. Okay. The beginning of the book of Acts starts with repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. No belief in the, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You get to the end of the book of Acts, and it gets to re repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. There was a transition. They still tried to preach the kingdom of heaven again. It almost reminds me of the Old Testament again. They screwed up. Remember that story I told you? They screwed up. They were supposed to go into the land and take it. And uh, Joshua, and uh, there was two of them out of the 12 spies that went in. Two of them stood up and said, we can do it. If God says we can do it, I don't care how strong they look or how scary it might seem because you're looking at the world. We're looking at God. If God said we can take it, we can take it. And they rejected God. They, they started fearing the world. They wouldn't do it. They're going to go back to Egypt. God punishes them. Then they're like, okay, fine, we'll do this. After God said, okay, now you've missed your chance. It's not going to happen right now. You guys are going to wander for 40 years. Then they say, oh, no, we're going to grab our swords. Now we're going to go in and take it. And they failed miserably. It almost reminds me of this in the book of Acts. They're still trying to push the kingdom of God after God said, nope, they had their chance. They crucified my son. Here's the new gospel. But they're still trying to push the kingdom of God, a kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, to the point where God had to give Peter a vision that no, salvation has now gone out to the world. He gave him the vision of all the animals coming down. Oh, I don't eat anything that's clean. What I've made clean, call not thou common. And then someone, a Gentile comes to him saying, hey, we need to hear about the gospel that, you know, of Jesus Christ. Not the kingdom of heaven, but Jesus Christ. The gospel is for today. And he went in and preached the gospel to him. Now, once again, I said this. Some say it's just the outward showing, the water baptism. And I, I said, Brother Christ, when I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and I'll admit when I'm wrong. I've always pushed it's just an outward showing because I kept hearing everybody else say it. I've always believed it's not for salvation when I got truly saved and born again. Before I was saved, it was part of salvation or just something that comes with salvation, something you do that has a connection to salvation. Okay? But when I truly got saved and born again, it's not part of salvation. But I'd always say, it's just an outward showing. If you want to get baptized, you can get baptized. I'm telling you, baptism doesn't do anything for you. Chapter and verse where water baptism is an outward showing. Paul talks about the new creature in Christ Jesus. The changed life. The new man. Don't resurrect the old man. The new man. He talks about living a life of Christ being the outward showing. He doesn't go back to water baptism. Where does he say water baptism is? We just read how he says, I don't get in call to be water baptized. You guys are getting distracted by water baptism. What's important is the baptism of the Holy Ghost through Jesus Christ. And it can only be found through Jesus Christ. 
you got to go back to the cross. When you bring in water baptism, it's almost making the cross of Christ of none effect. Because you get focused on that man that's doing the baptism, that great man of God, the prophet, like John the Baptist was, a prophet. And you stop focusing on Jesus Christ. You get focused on that man. The outward showing is a changed life, being a new creature in Christ Jesus, living a life of Christ. A lot of people think they can avoid this. Here's a big key right here. A lot of people think they can avoid this by simply being dunked under water. No, I, I just want the water baptism to be my outward showing. Why? So then I don't have to give up sin. I don't have to give up the way I live. I'm not saying you have to give up everything, but I'm saying when I got saved, a lot of my life changed. A lot of what I was doing and how I was living didn't please God. Sometimes what I was doing, even though it wasn't a sin, God's like, that's not what I want for you. If you want more peace and joy and happiness, do this over here. And I gave up something that might not have been a sin for something that God wanted for me. Something I wanted for something that God wanted for me. Okay? There's a changed life. Your attitude, the way you look at life, everything changes. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And the all things is how you look at it. When I was lost, it was about pleasing the flesh, pleasing the people around me, pleasing the world. But after I got saved, it became 100% about pleasing God. And God tells us how to please God through His Word. But it became about, Lord, you command. I was in charge when I was lost. When I'm, now that you're saved and born again, God's in charge. There's a difference. But people think, well, I can just go to put on my nice suit and tie and go to my Babel building, where two or more gather together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, and I can get my water baptism on, and that can be the outward showing. That has nothing to do with it. That's not, the, that's not an outward showing. The lost world does the same thing. They take baths. They wash themselves. They put on nice suits and ties. They go to these buildings built with man's hands. What's different? What's this, what, what calls us out from this world? To be separate. The changed life. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so much more. If any man be in Christ, like say he's a new creature, and there's commands of God, staying from all appearance of evil, and I can keep going. But it's the changed life that's the outward showing, and people are trying to get around that. Even the Baptists of today are trying to get around that. They're still out there enjoying the wickedness and sin of the world, indulging the flesh, but they did their water baptism. Sorry about that, I didn't mean to get off on that too much, but brothers and Christ, don't get so caught up in water baptism. Okay? If you didn't get water baptized, don't worry about it. It's not required, nor is it necessary after salvation. That's just for the kingdom of heaven. Did you go to the cross and get baptized by the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord? That's what matters. That's all that matters. For today, rightly dividing the word of truth, when Jesus was still physically walking, that water baptism did matter. It was important, but it's not important today. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, how do you have Jesus with you today in the kingdom of God, time of the Gentiles? 2 Timothy 4.16. Remember that verse, 2 Timothy 4.16. In uh, Matthew 18, we read about how we're two or more gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I think it's 18.20. Let's see if I can get that right. My memory's not always the best. Uh, I messed it all up, but it's in verse 18, Matthew 18, where two or more gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Okay. But we're getting back to 2 Timothy 4, 16, where is that true today? No. You can be one person and have Jesus with you. You can be 15 people and you have Jesus with you, not because there's two or more gathered together in his name. They each have to be saved and born again. They each have to have the Holy Spirit. Or Jesus isn't with you. 
You, I always say you can have eight saved and two lost. The eight saved have Jesus with them. The two that are lost do not have Jesus with them. You have to get saved and born again to have Jesus Christ with you today. And I think that if you go to a Babel building and we can invite lost people in, Jesus is going to be there for them too. No, he's not. They need to go to the cross. And if they reject the cross, Jesus isn't in the midst, isn't there with them today. 2 Timothy 4.16 and my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. He's alone, but he's not alone. And strengthened me, and by, my pre by me the preaching might be fully known. Fully known. We're going to talk about that. And that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Gentiles might be here. How about salvation of Gentiles and Jews? Yes, it is today. But Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And today the body of Christ is predominantly Gentiles because the Jews can't get over the Old Testament for the New Testament. They reject Jesus Christ as a whole. There's still some Jews that got saved and there's still Jews that can get saved today. But for the most part, it's the Gentiles that are getting saved today. That all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, verse 18, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. It was partially known in the book of Acts. Started out with, started, once again, started out with repent and be baptized, and ends with repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It was repent and be baptized for the mission of sins, and then it was not the belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, but just repent and be baptized for remission of sins because Jesus can come back any day now and rule and reign. He died. He was buried. He rose again the third day. We saw him ascend up to heaven. He said he's coming back. He's going to come back and rule and reign. That's how Acts starts out. But then it ends with, uh, okay, he's, it's got put off. It's repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So we see that. How do you get Jesus with you today? Paul's by himself. Not two or more gathered together, but Paul's by himself, and he has Jesus with him. How do you get to be like that? John 14, 15, we read, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Maybe that's a good way to say it. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come down and be with them. He dwelleth with you. But he wasn't in them yet. So this is Jesus prophesying after his death how it would work. And he shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will come to you. I will come to you? No, he just talked about the Holy Spirit coming. Where two or more gather together in my name, there am I in the midst of them? Jesus says, I'm with them. But he wasn't physically there. The body wasn't there. What was there? The Holy Spirit. But today, if you want Jesus with you, the Holy Spirit to be in you permanently, it's no longer just with you, but it's with you and in you. Okay? You have to get saved today. Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Remember, the kingdom of heaven was only for the Jewish people, not the Gentiles. Go not in the way of the Gentiles. The water baptism is, the water baptism is just for the Jewish people. Like I said, the book of Acts, the transition book, Peter was baptizing with water. He was doing what he was taught by Jesus Christ, preaching the kingdom of heaven. And he had to get taught by the Holy Spirit and through that vision that, hey, salvation has now gone out to the Gentiles, to the world, and it's no longer the kingdom of heaven is no longer at hand. They rejected me. Look what they did to Stephen. I was ready if they would accept me, but they rejected me again. All right? So it got put off, and then they started preaching, repent, a repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Okay? Today, salvation goes out to the world. That's why it's called the time of the Gentiles. Because before the kingdom of heaven, salvation is only at the Jews. The time of the Gentiles doesn't mean a Jew can't get saved, but the Gentiles get adopted in. Now a Jew and a Gentile can get saved. Either one can get saved. Anybody can get saved today. That's what it means by the time of the Gentiles. Salvation has gone out to the world. Anybody can get saved today. But we're going to go over it again because a lot of people don't like this. This is where our focus needs to be in these last days. Not fearing an economic collapse. Not fearing a World War III. Not fearing a, a, a civil war. Not fearing what the world's doing to each other. And that you might, might, if God allows it. Because remember, we forget. God's the one in charge. If God allows us to get caught in the crosshairs so that we can be there for open doors to preach the gospel, then so be it. But our main focus, brothers, is Christ needs to be on preaching the gospel and living the life of Christ. Not fear-mongering what's going on in the world. People always hit me up, why aren't you talking about what's going on in the world? I'm talking about how we're supposed to live no matter what's going on in the world. How we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to stand. No matter what. Okay. Salvation for today, time of Jacob's trouble. Repentance, 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Now rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner. We read when John was preaching repentance, it was supposed to be repentance towards God. Not sorrow towards a brother and sister in Christ. Or not, sister Christ I'm sorry. not sorrow for someone what, what you did to someone around you. That sorrow was not towards somebody else down here. That sorrow wasn't towards the consequences of your actions and the, what was going, what's going on down here. But that, even in the kingdom of heaven, that repentance still needed to be towards God. That ye were made sorry after a godly manner. Having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that put Jesus on the cross, who is God the Father, manifest in the flesh. That you've sinned against God, you're going to you're on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. There's the fear. And that fear turns to sorrow. I'm so sorry. I there's nothing I can do. I deserve to go to hell, and Lord, I'm just so sorry. I never should have sinned against you. I'm just so sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. I'm just so sorry. And tears, you know, just heartfelt, heartfelt. Not a head thing. It's a heartfelt. That ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. It starts with that fear of God that turns to godly sorrow that motivates repent true repentance. Biblical repentance. And that true repentance, that biblical repentance, leads to salvation. Why? Because it leads you to the cross. Lord, I'm so sorry. I don't want to go to hell, Lord. Please forgive me. What must I do to go to heaven? What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what push, points you to Jesus Christ. Here. Not having the knowledge. The average professing Christian in this world today has the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But he's not here. He's not a hidden man of the heart. They just have the knowledge of him. I used to call it fake faith because it talks about faith unfeigned, where faith can be fake. What's fake faith? It's head knowledge. Someone can have head knowledge, but where's the life? We talked about that. Made unto us uh, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. That's what it means to be in Christ Jesus our Lord. Where are those things? If they're all talk, they just have head knowledge. Like I said, a lot of people trying to avoid the changed life, those four things, by just doing physical works. going to Wearing your Sunday best, going to the Babel buildings, getting water baptized. Okay? They don't want the changed life. They don't want to actually give their life to Jesus Christ the way he gave his life for the sins of the world. You're supposed to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, you gave your life to Jesus Christ. Old man is dead and buried. New man is raised. Repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. And it's the sorrows of the world and the wickedness of the world and the fleshliness of the world that prevents a lot of people from truly getting saved and born again. They got the head knowledge. It never makes it down here because like we talked about, they'd rather do some physical work that they can say, okay, I did that. 
I don't have to have a changed life after salvation. They go into it not truly giving their life to Jesus Christ. Lord, whatever you command, I do. And brother says, Christ, I'm still repenting to this day. I'm still repenting for my sins, present tense, because that's the difference. There's a lost sinner, and there's a saved sinner. There's no such thing as a sinless person, present tense, other than Jesus Christ. But he's up in heaven right now. Down here, present tense. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. They together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's not one sinless person. And after salvation, one, some of the false religions out there, they try to teach this sinless perfection, how you're sinlessly perfect now. And you can point out all their sins and wickedness they're still presently doing as a professing Christian. Oh no, it's, it's, it's not what you think. It's on the cross. It's on the cross. You know, they use the cross as a credit card. I, I, I upset a lot of, and I'm glad I did, because hopefully it got them out of their comfort zone. And got them over to the true plan of salvation and shocked them into thinking, realizing that, hey, they're fake and they're a fraud. But the easy believism, the faith alone crowd, you know, that they're using the cross as a credit card. They're not truly sorry. They never come to God broken. A broken and contrite. God saveth such that of a broken and contrite spirit. It's in the book of Psalms. He saith such that are of a broken and contrite spirit. That's instruction righteousness. That's applied in every dispensation. Every dispensation. True repentance has to do with coming to God in a broken and contrite spirit. And God saith such that are of that. Okay. But they say, oh no, it's just on the cross, on the cross. All my sins, present, past, present, and future. And I'm like, so you're planning on sinning? I know I'm going to sin in the future. There's a difference between knowing it and planning it. And they just, anytime you call out their sins, they get upset. Who are you to judge me? It's on the cross. It's on the cross. I got them really upset because it's like, just a credit card. What you're really saying is whip them again. There's not enough blood. There's not enough, you know, pain. There's not enough anguish. He, he needs to suffer more. Hit him again. That's what they're saying. Why? Because they've never come to God broken. Because someone who comes broken looks at that and goes, stop, stop. It's, he's not supposed to go through that. I'm supposed to go through that. I deserve that. Stop. You guys need to stop whipping him. It's my fault. It's my fault. Almost like you see a man about to be convicted for a crime that you committed. You run up and go, stop. Don't kill him. It's, it, I'm the one that did it. I'm the guilty party. But they don't want to do that. They stand back and go, here's my credit card. Swipe the credit card. Oh, whip him again. Keep whipping them. Keep whipping them. So I can sin all I want. And it's all under the cross. That's not someone who's broken. That's not someone who's come to God broken. And the average, when I was in the Bible buildings, the average professing Christian had that attitude. They just sit back and watch them be beaten and whipped. Watch them be crucified. They just stand back and watch. No, the person who's broken comes to them saying, I deserve that. Stop hitting him. Stop whipping him. Oh, Lord, I'm so sorry that they did that to you. It's my fault. I deserve that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Loved, past tense. He did that because he loves us. Love for Jesus Christ is keeping his word. You know, repentance is part of salvation for today. It's been a part of salvation for a lot of dispensations. Every dispensation started out with fearing God and turning back to Him in repentance. Coming to Him broken and broken and contrite spirit, having sorrow every time. Okay. That's almost been in every dispensation. The next part is believing on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 1 Corinthians 15.1 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. I always like to point this out. He's preaching to professing Christians. The average person that's going to watch this, I doubt a lost person's made it this far, but they have, they have. But the average person that's watching this is professing Christian. All right. That's what he's preaching the, 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 the gospel to again. Because he's saying to the Corinthians, I don't see a changed life. You guys are so carnal. You're so worldly. I don't know. I don't think. I don't think it took. If any man be, call, if a man be called a brother, if any man be in Christ, if, 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 I don't know. 
I just don't know. You know what? I'm going to err on the side of caution, and I'm going to preach the gospel to you again. Moreover, brethren, I, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye had believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that how I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. How he died. That is important how he died. How he died. He bled out. He was nailed to a cross, but the most important part of how he died is he bled. It's that blood that washes sins away. In the Old Testament, they did animal sacrifices, and that blood covered their sins, but didn't take it away. What's different about Jesus Christ? It's God's blood. It's God's blood. Jesus is God, the Father, manifest in the flesh. When you have people today that are very adamant, they've done the study, and they still deny that Jesus Christ is God the Father, you're not dealing with someone who's truly saved and born again. Only God's blood can wash your sins away. And there's only, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, there's only one capital G, God the Father. There's only one God, period, and it's the Father. If there's no connection between the Son and the Father that makes Jesus God, the Father, manifest in the flesh... His blood can do nothing for you. How he died, the blood. Okay. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What's the point of raising again the third day? Remember the scriptures talk about how the Holy Spirit rose him from the dead. That God the Father rose him from the dead. And he said, if you destroy this temple, and he's talking about his own himself. In three days, I will raise it up. He's talking about himself, but they think that he's talking about that temple that they were looking at, the Jewish people. The actual physical temple. He said he's going to destroy it down, destroy this temple and build it in three days. He's talking about his body. But Jesus said he'd rise him up. The God had raised Jesus up, proving that Jesus is God. Fully and completely. A lot of people, this is where they skip the first part, repentance, and they have the knowledge of what Jesus Christ did. They can tell you what Jesus Christ did, just like I'm telling you what Jesus Christ did. But where's that heartfelt, I deserve that. What Jesus went through, I deserve. I deserve to die. I deserve to go through that. It's me that should have been whipped within an inch of my life. It's me that should have been nailed to that cross. I should have died. And if you look into it a little bit more, when Jesus says, I thirst, he talked about the rich man and Lazarus. When Jesus said on the cross that I thirst, he did all his burning on the cross. He didn't actually go to the fiery sides of hell. He went down to Abraham's bosom. He went down to hell to Abraham's bosom, but he didn't go to the fiery sides of hell. He didn't burn in hell. He burned on the cross. He is burning on the cross. See, he did what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go to hell. I'm supposed to burn. Now, he didn't go to hell like the fiery hells, but I'm supposed to burn. Remember we talked about how Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire? All judgment has been given to the Son, Jesus Christ. I'm supposed to burn. But he did it for me. Lord, I'm so sorry and I am so grateful. That heartfelt attitude. Okay? You repent and you believe. In the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. His blood is God's blood. It washed away my sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And he's, and he's coming in the clouds someday to take me home. If I don't get called in death, home in death, I'll be called home in life. And a little side note about being called home in death. I was reading the Old Testament about cherub, cherub, if I say it, cherub, cherubim. And how they're the taxi drivers of God, and they take the fiery chariots, which I believe is a cherubim, comes in, and he takes, because the cherubim is, is, is pulling the fiery chariot, and takes Elijah up and everything. And I kind of wonder, today, when a man dies, we can't see the spiritual, we can only see the physical. If a man dies, or a woman dies, a brother or sister in Christ dies, this, uh, if we could see it, how amazing it is, something comes down, grabs that person's soul, and takes them up to heaven. Okay. But we're looking for that catching away, the, the, 
uh, for Jesus Christ in the clouds to call us home. That's what we're looking for. He went to heaven, he died, he was buried, he rose again, he ascended to heaven, and someday he's coming back for his bride. Either I get caught up in death, or I get caught up in life. The catching away of the body of Christ, the, the day of Christ. That's what the Bible calls it. Okay. You got those two steps. What are those two steps that tie in together? What do those two steps lead to? They lead to the third step, confess. Romans 8.10 But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The heart, not the head. If you have the knowledge, you can get saved. If you do water baptism, you can get saved. You put on a nice suit and tie and go to a Bible building, you're saved. No. But the heart may believe unto righteousness, but the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There's verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth salvation. Mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You'll not be ashamed of preach of confessing and prayer to God. And then verbally to the people around you, you will not be ashamed to confess Jesus Christ. Not just with your words. Remember we talked about you're a living witness and you're a verbal witness. Two things. Living witness, verbal witness. We're talking about the verbal part. Okay? The confession. Romans 10.12, you jump down to Romans 10.12, it says, For there is no difference between the Jew or Greek. Remember, anybody can get saved in the time of the Gentiles. Salvation goes out to the world where Gentiles can get adopted into the Jews. When it comes to salvation, anybody can get saved. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich upon all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today you have this being taken out. They took repentance out. Now they're taking out call and ask. Call means ask. They're taking out confess your repentance and your belief to Jesus Christ in prayer. I deserve to go to hell, but it's only through Jesus Christ. That's confession. I deserve to go to hell. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner. And I fear hell. And I'm so sorry, Lord, that I'm going to hell. I'm sorry for my sins. But what your, what your son did for me on the cross, what Jesus Christ, God Father, manifest in the flesh, did for me on the cross, and you go through and say, only by the blood of Jesus Christ has my sins been washed away. Because Jesus is God. He died, was buried, and rose again the third day. And I'm telling you, it was Jesus Christ that saved me. Okay? Jesus baptized me with the Holy Ghost. It was only Jesus Christ that could save me. That's confessing in prayer to God, and you, conf and you confess that to the people around you. Then you ask God to save you. Why? Because you don't deserve it, and you didn't do anything to deserve it. If, if I go to a man that owes me $50, I go to him and say, give me $50. Why? I'm not asking him, I'm telling him because he owes it to me. Now, if I'm desperate and I need $50 and I go over to a neighbor's house or a friend or a brother or whatever, and I say, listen, can I have 50 bucks? I really need 50 bucks to pay a bill. Can I have 50 bucks? Why do you ask? Because you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. What are they doing? They're taking asking out of salvation. You don't ask. All these easy believism, faith alone heretics, they take out repentance along with the belief in the finished work. Of, they keep the belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, but they go hand in hand. You take one out, you're actually taking both out. They only have the knowledge. They're no longer faith. It's just knowledge when you take repentance out. We've talked about this. I'm a living witness that it took repenting and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing both in prayer and asking God to save me to truly get saved and born again. The changed life. Okay. Ask. Why? Because you don't deserve it. 
Lord, I don't deserve to be saved. Lord, only through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, can I be saved. Only that blood can wash my sins away. Lord, please, can you save me? Now, I talked about the confession after salvation, but the confession to God in salvation is going to be more like, I believe what Jesus Christ did on the cross because it's God's blood. They died and was buried and rose again the third day, and only Jesus' blood can wash my sins away. Lord, I, I don't deserve it. Can you please save me? I'm still... You can really tell how far things have fallen and how bad the world is when they take, ask, call upon the name of the Lord out of salvation. All these heretics. The Romans rode to hell. Heretics. Satanists. They don't want to get saved and born again God's way. They don't want to do things God's way. They want to do things their way. That's why they add water baptism to salvation. Why? Because they want to do things their way. They don't want to do things God's way. Water baptism was God's way under the kingdom of heaven. Water baptism is not for today. Where two or more gathered together in my name was under the kingdom of heaven. Today, in order to be have Jesus with you, you need to get saved and born again. Repent. Believe, repent. Believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. You can even beg God to save you. I did. I don't deserve it. And after salvation, after salvation, there's a new birth, a changed life. And that changed life only comes from true conversion. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. The new birth. The new man. Or the new woman, sister in Christ. Man is in mankind. The new man is in mankind. Uh -huh. Brothers, says Christ, I get called a Paul, uh, Paulinian a lot lately because I say, when you try to tell me this is how you do things doctrinally, I always bring up these are the doctrines that, that and someone might be able to add one that I might have missed, but doctrines aren't like tons and tons of doctrines. Some people are confusing doctrine with instruction and righteousness. Now, we just read from Hebrews, that's instruction and righteousness. That's not doctrine. It's instruction righteousness. This is how God, this is the right way that God does things. But there's a, when there's a testament, anytime it changes, this has to happen. That's how we got from the Old Testament to the New Testament. There's other places that have good instruction righteousness. But when it comes to doctrine, here's the doctrines. The gospel. That's a doctrine. What's the gospel for today? You're going to find it in the Pauline epistles, which we just read there. Eternal security. Where are you going to find that? In the Pauline epistles. That's doctrine. Where do we start learning about dispensations? In the Pauline epistles. And then we start looking back and through the Pauline epistles. It's like, it's like we're looking at the, the Old Testament like this. Is how people are looking at it. Then you get to the Pauline epistles in the New Testament. And Paul's like, here's dispensational goggles. Let me tell you about dispensations. And you put this on, you look and go, oh, now everything starts to fit in place. There's different dispensations. But that's primarily taught in the Pauline epistles. So that we can go back and rightly divide the whole Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15. And then we can look forward and say, okay, now we know there's a dispensation of the time of Jacob's trouble. We know there's a dispensation of the day of the Lord, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And we always call it the last dispensation where the new heaven and the new earth and we go out into eternity. Okay. We put all these glasses. So you have the gospel, you have eternal security, dispensational teaching, and the day of Christ, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, before the time of Jacob's trouble. Those are four there, and I, I hope I haven't left out too much, but those are the main doctrines. Okay. And then there's instruction righteousness. Okay. But doctrinally, those are the doctrines for today. I, I, I just I just throw those out there real quick. They're not in my notes. Um, and we've been talking for a while, so please forgive me getting a little tired. But there are major doctrines. They call it major doctrines, and then minor doctrines. No, they're just doctrines. Chapter and verse where it says major doctrine, minor doctrine. It's not there. That's garbage also. There's just doctrine. Okay? There's just doctrine. What are the doctrines for today? The gospel. Get saved. 
eternal security. When you're saved, you're sealed, you're born again. You're sealed into the day of redemption. Dispensations. How do we find the gospel? For today, through dispensational teaching, through dispensations. We find out what dispensations for us, and then we read about that gospel. The Pauline epistles are for us, so then we read the gospel and the Pauline epistles and go, okay, this is how you get saved today. Okay. And then what are we living for after we get saved? We're living for Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope. Okay. Because some people try to bring in, well, what about the judgment seat of Christ? Well, that's part of looking for that blessed hope. We're looking for Jesus Christ because someday he's going to call us home to be judged someday. So we need to live a good life of Jesus, for Jesus Christ down here. Even after salvation, we need to be careful how we live. We need to live for him. All our works, both good and bad, are going to be burnt up. Brothers, says Christ, I'm going to leave you with these sets of verses. Okay. Rightly divide the word of truth. Don't worry about them calling you a Paulinian or anything because you believe that the doctrines that for today, if they're going to say it's a doctrine, make sure that they're actually using the word doctrine properly. They're not. I, I caught Peter. I'm going to call it out by name. I caught Peter Ruckman, and I can't remember, but he grabbed something from Hebrews, which is a great verse, and it was instruction in righteousness. Just like I grabbed from Hebrews to show instruction in righteousness on how the transition from an Old Testament to a New Testament works. It's instruction righteousness. He'll, he grabbed a verse from there and said, Now you see this doctrine? It's in, the, it's in Hebrews. It's not in the Pauline epistle. But it wasn't a doctrine. They're grabbing things that are instruction and righteousness and trying to claim it's a doctrine for today. It's not. It's just instruction and righteousness. What can we learn from the two or more gathered together in my name? There am I in the midst of them. If the, the instruction righteousness for us to learn is if you want Jesus there, you better do it God's way. And that time period when Jesus was still physically walking and he was repenting, repent, or preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You better get repent, you better get water baptized, and all those steps that we talked about. Absolutely. Is that for today? No. The instruction righteous, if you want Jesus with you, you better do it God's way. Period. If you refuse to do it God's way, he ain't going to be with you. That's the instruction righteousness. Do you want Jesus with you? Then you, whether you're one by yourself or with a group of people, you want Jesus with you. Then you need to truly get saved and born again today and do it God's way today. Repent, believe, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. And after He saves you, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Romans 10, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. But they have not obeyed the gospel. What's the command today? Remember what Jesus said, obey our, my commands. He didn't love, you know, if you love me, you'll keep my word. What's the command today? To obey the gospel. What's the gospel for today? Is it the kingdom of heaven gospel? No. Don't get, don't get deceived into going back under the Old Testament. No. James 1.21 Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive, the, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Repentance. Like I said, that's in every, uh, almost every dispensation, repentance is there. And what gets in the way of you repenting, truly having sorrow in your heart? Superfluity of naughtiness, filthiness, sin. Your do you, people sin gets in the way. Their addictions, their love of sin, their love of the flesh, love of worldliness when it goes against God gets in the way, and they refuse to get saved. They refuse to listen to the word of God and get saved God's way. And we've talked about how to get saved God's way today. Second Corinthians four three. But if our gospel be hid, you know, the Romans rode to hell, those Satanists. Uh, the Romans rode to heaven. Pardon me. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. 
and whom the God, lowercase g God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. It's the Romans' road to hell. Ignore what they're saying. Their works, uh, repentance is just works. Oh, now prayers all of a sudden will work. It wasn't in the past, but now all of a sudden prayers will work. So repentance is not part of salvation. Prayer, confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you in prayer, that's not part of salvation. In whom the God, lowercase g, God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. People buy into that. What, I only have to have the knowledge and just say I believe? <sighs> sign me up. The whole world, sign me up. But they're not saved. Why? Because the lowercase g God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. He's the body of God. Image is the flesh. Image is physical. The image of God, he's the body of God should shine unto them. Verse 5, For we preach, for we preach not ourselves. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. Water baptism, why is it a bad thing today? Because it gets people to think of that person that's baptizing them. I'm of so-and-so. You start falling into occults. I'm of so-and-so. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of John the Baptist. Well, we only knew of the, the, the baptism of, of John. Well, what about being baptized by Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit? We never heard of that. For we preach not ourselves. I'm not saying this because I get any joy out of telling people that they're going to hell, Brother Sister Christ, or that some of the brethren out there, or professing Christians out there, are false. I don't get any joy in it. I'm not preaching for myself so I can get something out of it here and now. I'm doing it because I'm commanded to by God. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. We're serving God and being your servant. We're doing what God commands us to do, which is to preach the gospel. Right. I'm to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. No matter what's going on out there, I'm to keep preaching truth. And the number one truth that we're supposed to be preaching, brethren, that are in ministry, is the gospel. And keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope. Right. Now, back to the main part of the study. I'm sorry this has been long for a little bit, but you want Jesus with you today? Get saved. God's way. For today. Right. The gospel is revealed to John. Or not John. The gospel is revealed to Paul, not the kingdom of heaven gospel that John the Baptist was preaching. Don't get suckered into going back to the Old Testament after salvation. But a lot of people are being deceived through the Old Testament trying to get saved, and you're never going to get saved that way. Get saved and born again. Start walking with God and not against Him. Walk with Him. 2 Timothy 2.15 Rightly dividing the word of truth. Start walking with God and stop fighting them. Right. Now we can get into the argument about two. You can get caught up in an argument about where two. They try to adjust it for battle balloons. Where two or more gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But the important part is, is how do we get saved today? Right. That's what's important. How do you live for Jesus Christ today? Chapter and verse. We need to go back to chapter and verse, brother, says Christ, chapter and verse. When you start walking with God, not against Him. And a lot of brethren are fall, becoming part of the falling away, and they're starting to walk against Him. But you have a lot of false converts, the Bible says false brethren, that their whole life is just walking against God. But they have a profession. They have a verbal profession. They have the knowledge. But their whole life is just walking against God. So, brothers says Christ, am I a Paulinian? Right? I don't care if people call me that. I really don't. But what am I? I'm a Bible believer. And I believe in 2 Timothy 2.15, which says rightly dividing the word of truth. Right? I believe in dispensations. I believe that we're to live a life for Jesus Christ today. Right? How to get saved today. How to live a life for Jesus Christ today. Don't let them get you down, brother, says Christ. Don't let them try to divide us. <laughs> when they're not rightly dividing, they try to divide us and get us to turn on each other. 
stand, 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 don't faint, don't falter, and keep, you know, I always want to say keep marching on, you know, as a good soldier for Jesus Christ. Keep marching, keep living for Jesus Christ, keep that walk with the Lord going and keep it strong. And I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching, thank you for your prayers, and I will see you in the next video.